Um, hello, and thank you for joining us for another discussion with uh, Sheila Law from the Unerase Book Club. Fatima Hoke, who's usually here, will not be joining us tonight. Um, tonight, we are discussing Bright Lines by Tanwi Nandini Islam, and I know that since the book came out, the author has changed their name to Tanais, and they use they, them pronouns. So in this discussion, um, we could reflect that. And I will start by introducing myself, and then we could all give a little short introduction before we jump into the discussion. I am Lucy, and I'm a library tech. Uh, I work in the youth department doing story times and youth programs, and I also do some programming for adults. I especially enjoy participating in book discussions. So I'm very glad to be here. Hey, I'm Jacob. Um, I'm also an Ann Arbor District Library employee. I work in the outreach department. And as always, really excited to be here. I'm Christopher. I also work at the Ann Arbor District Library as a library tech in the youth department. And I've been so happy to have the chance to do more reading this year. And my name's Lauren. I also work at AADL. I'm a desk clerk, and I've uh, had the chance to participate in another of these Unerased Book Club discussions. I previously got to read Passage West, um, so I'm excited to be in book discussion number two with you all. Awesome, and I'm Sheila Lal. I do not work at the Ann Arbor District Library. <laughs> uh, I uh, am the founder and co-creator. Uh, creator and co-facilitator of the Unerased Book Club with Fatima. And it's a project of Rising Voices. Um, we've talked about it before. Uh, and I actually just wanna go ahead and just provide a brief summary for people who may not have read the book um, before we get started. Bright Lines by um, tonight's formerly known as Thanwi Nandani Islam is a coming of age story. It is not a young adult novel, which I know it can be often, uh, oftentimes conflated, but it's a coming of age story with um, a mixed family, a uh, mixed Bangladeshi and Bangladeshi American family in Brooklyn um, in the early late 90s, early 2000s time period, um, pre-aggressive uh, gentrification, and is really about um, the one of the main characters, Ella, coming to terms with sexuality, gender, and also family secrets and history. And the book takes place both in Brooklyn and in Bangladesh. So I'll leave it at that. And um, the way I like to open all book clubs is, how did you feel about the book? Well, I'll start. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. And it's another book uh, through this, this series of book discussions that wouldn't maybe have come across my radar. Um, and so I was very glad to be introduced to um, particularly this this setting in Brooklyn, where it's, it's sort of um, a, a mix of communities and different entrepreneurship um, opportunities and people with their side hustles. And I don't know, it was very interesting. And then I also learned a lot about Bangladesh and I found myself then wanting to do some research to learn more about um, what I was reading about. So I really enjoyed it. And I found that it had me doing sort of a deeper dive into some of what I was learning about. Yeah, I definitely want to echo what Lucy said. It, um, it, it made me want to know more. Um, something I'm still wondering if I appreciate or not so much appreciate about the book is I never um, felt like I found my footing, which made the reading so exciting. But then it, it, there's also, the, the word isn't stress. There's a level of like, I couldn't find my footing. So, which was exhilarating and confusing. <laughs> I also enjoyed the book and I found some of the passages and some of the scenes very effective and so moving. And of course, some were very startling. And I really enjoyed the finding of the letter at the end of the book. I thought that was beautiful. Um, yeah, and I, one other thing I just wanted to say quickly is I, I loved the mixture of languages and cultures, especially at the end of the book. My neighbor happens to be Kasi. And so I thought that was really interesting. Here I'm reading this book and it's connecting me to my neighborhood in Ann Arbor. That's very cool. Um, 
Yeah, I guess I would um, echo several things that people have already said um, that I think that there are, um, I, I had to just sort of go with the fact that I never felt grounded in this narrative. I never really felt like I knew exactly what was going to happen around the corner here. Um, and there were a couple of um, somewhat shocking moments for me in the narrative that um, almost jolted me like I, I just couldn't almost believe them. So, um, and, and maybe that's to be expected with the book like that has a cover like this, you know, it's like very psychedelic and just like, here we go. Like we're going on a ride. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm a bike rider. So I, I, I really got excited when I saw the cover of this particular book um, and thought, oh yeah, I got to read that one. Um, and yeah, and then um, to something I think Lucy said that um, it, it made me want to research a bit more um, Particularly, I felt like I, you know, this book mentions or has 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 uh, a good deal to do. At least uh, their characters experienced the Bangladesh Liberation War, I believe, um, and uh, and so I, I don't know anything about that. And that this was my first point of entry into that conflict. You know, um, Christopher, I love that your neighbor is Kasi. That's uh, such a small, it's an indigenous group for people who are not familiar with the Kasi people. Um, and the, the, the indigenous homeland is what is now like Northern Bangladesh into Northeast India. Um, so it's in that region of the world. Um, and I actually want to say that the, the like 10% or 15% of the book that was set in Bangladesh was probably my favorite because we were exposed to so much um, really good exploration. It almost felt like travel writing, honestly, than it did literary or uh, narrative writing. Um, and that really, that felt more sturdy than the writing set in Brooklyn. And I've actually been reading this book on and off for the past two years because, Jacob, like what you're saying with the unevenness and almost um, not really getting a foothold in it. And the only reason I finished it was to have conversations. And so again, like, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, if it's intentional or not, but definitely felt that. And I, I would also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention how relentlessly queer this book is, which is just like so, so I'm thinking about Passage West and it's kind of a brick of a book. And, you know, around page 300, I'm like, this would be cool if it was a little bit gay and it's like <laughs> reading this book it was just relentlessly queer the whole time which was I thoroughly enjoyed <laughs> I don't know if we talked about uh, I, I think Fatima may have brought it up briefly about not knowing if their relationship in Passage West uh, this was like queer coded we talked to the yes. author was oh okay. <gasps> ah. yeah <laughs> twist <laughs> okay nice okay <laughs> So yeah, no, but totally get it. And honestly, I think because like I have, I mean, I personally am, I don't identify as queer, but I have a lot of queer friends, and I just consume a lot of queer media by by like osmosis and proximity. And so I didn't realize how queer it was because it just read like normal. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Like, yeah, I would say, no. I would, like, I, I, I do, I read a lot of um, books with queer characters, and and so it does. I think it's, I, I enjoy now that it's starting to read more as normal because, like, that is actually that's the world, right? And so I found it refreshing to um, find a book like this where that was there were just queer characters throughout. And and characters in in various um, stages of figuring out where they were, as far yeah. as um, being queer or you know what their identity. And um, I I liked that part of the story. Um, so I'm curious if any of you have lived in New York before. I have, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you were you in Brooklyn or did you visit Brooklyn often? I visited Brooklyn. I'm not often and um not you know because i lived in manhattan so it would be to uh cross the, the brooklyn bridge or visit a friend that i had who lived there um but i didn't get a glimpse of brooklyn like this and um i i really enjoyed as i said before reading about this brooklyn that is like just such a mix of of cultures and people and um, 
all these people trying to find a different way to, um, to make a living, but also in a way that like is expressive of who they are, you know? Um, like I think of Hashi with her, with her just understanding, like she can look at a person and she's like, I know who you are on the inside. I can make that come out. Like, I just love that. Um, you too. And, you know, so it was, it was not a Brooklyn that I had seen and I enjoyed seeing it here. I would love to spend an afternoon in Hashi's beauty salon. That seems like so much fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Connected to that point, I think about how it's almost nostalgic to think about a period when um, somebody could use like their skill or passion to make a living without Mm -hmm. you still worry about the precarity of it, but it's not so tenuous the way it feels now where you have to have a safety net really to get to like take higher risks, like opening a small business or having something as seemingly boutique as a uh, perfumery or um, uh, botanical type store. Mm -hmm. that's almost what I was longing for, not um, on top of the idea of very integrated uh, communities. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've never lived uh, in New York, uh, this all, but it, I mean, the neighborhood that is sort of conjured up in this book um, feels like kind of like a halcyon, like too good to be true. Like, wow, this is incredible. Like what? Your brownstone sounds sick with this amazing garden and you're making it work with your passion, as you're saying, Sheila. I mean, it just kind of feels like damn, I want to live here. And uh, I think that somebody on the back of the book blurbed it in such a way that it said something like, I want to live in this world. And yeah, I mean, what the characters managed to do in New York, it just feels very, I don't know, it's, it feels like a love letter to like a maybe a bygone era of New York or maybe, I don't know, maybe this never really quite existed. I have no clue, but yeah. um, it, it seemed, yeah, I definitely felt myself falling into the fantasy of of the new york community yeah i kept wanting to go to google maps and identify places that i had never heard of and the streets see just how much uh it maps onto real life or not because there are so many different places that are mentioned in the book you know where they go swimming and you know there are lots and lots of street names and parks and i i should have uh looked at a map but i was i was reading the book so quickly i didn't want to stop and break the flow of what i was reading it also kind of like reminds oh go ahead i i was just gonna ask um what you guys thought about um i think it was anwar sleeping with ramon couldn't handle it I, I it just couldn't handle that. It was one of those two shocking moments where I just thought, I, where did we come to to get to here? Uh, Ramona is just sort of described in prior to that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my pers- my memory I read this last month was that it was like, who is this like gorgeous you know lodger and um, didn't know much about her, and then all of a sudden it happens and it's it happens in such an improbable way and she's totally receptive to this guy and i didn't realize maybe how cool anwar was because that was how i was trying to understand it like after the fact like oh he's actually like really cool maybe that's why um because up to then he just seemed like a pretty like a sleepy stoner dad and like lovely but not cool enough to like pull something like that off that's my thought the thing that I found so difficult with that, I mean, there was a lot that I found difficult with that um, because also because I really liked the character of Hashi and I just feel like she was constantly just yeah. like, I don't know. And so that part made me angry, but also that he just goes through this door into her space and she lets him in the first time, but then he's just like, no, like she's my tenant, this door, you know, like the way he just all of a sudden is it so intrusive into her space that I just, it was making me feel like, I just was like, oh my God, it's like she's not even her home is yeah. private. She doesn't get make have, get a choice, you know, on whether or not he's coming in here because he's coming in this side door and I, you know, yeah, it made me uncomfortable. And I felt like that part wasn't, 
it didn't make sense in terms of character development because we learned later about like some peripheral sexual assault that had happened in his life mm-hmm. that had been very influential in the way that he perceived himself and perceived himself in comparison to family and to violate somebody else's space like just didn't feel correct Mm -hmm. Um, but then also I felt like personally attacked by that purely because like that like seemingly very healthy relationship between Anwar and uh, Hashi and reminded me of me and my husband and I was like I don't like this idea that it's like very sweet kind man who's like very invested in the idea of family and like does like cares a lot would just like decide to destroy that trust I mean, like, yes, I've been married to my husband for a little over a year, and this is a much longer relationship. But I'm like, mm, no. <laughs> and, and also, Hashi had said she wasn't like, "I'm mad that you cheated on me." She was like, "I'm mad that you were dumb enough for for me to catch you, yeah, and that you would do it in your own home." And like, yeah. you're stupid, and I'm stuck with you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's almost more hurtful than maybe if she flew out in, into a rage or. Yeah. That reaction was surprising to me. Yeah, and his thought is like, why did Ramona have to leave that shirt in the laundry? And it's like, well, that's a piece of it, but also there's a bigger why here, you know? Like, yeah, um, yeah that whole thing, it just... And also that he, he, he consciously says later, like, I have to, maybe I have to... Um, destroy I think he says like I have to shit on the good stuff that I have in order to enjoy it or something like he is conscious of the fact that he had this thing this good thing and that wasn't he needed to feel bad maybe I don't know and maybe that's part of you know going back to that other story and what he was exposed to and all that stuff so who knows I I found Ramona in that scene to be unbelievable because I think page one of the book starts with him sucking in his gut, talking about his paunch or something like that. And as you've all said, you know, he seems like a kind of sleepy stoner dad and everyone is lusting after Ramona. The only thing I could think of is that maybe she is looking to do something self-destructive to force her to change her life, you know, um, to to sleep with someone who is such an improbable mate and force her out of this situation in her life, mm-hmm. maybe. And it, it was over as soon as it as it had started. Like yeah. they you know, they have an affair, and then like four pages later, he's been. <laughs> um, accosted by Ramona's husband and is bloodied on the floor. And this is all happening really fast. And uh, th- there's a pacing thing about it too that made it feel, uh, added another la- layer of like um, unbelievability, mm-hmm. unbelievableness. I, I don't know yeah. the word. <laughs> I think both, let's go with both of those. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, speaking of, I might as well just like give it, like my other thing that I couldn't, I was shocked by was when Anwar and Hashi die. And oh. it's, um, and and uh, yeah, like how that is, how that happens, it, it feels so disjointed and abrupt and I wanted more reconciliation. I understand there was some and they, you know, um, but I, I was left like wondering what, um, you know, the author wanted us to feel about their relationship. I, yeah, I, I, I had to kind of just go, okay, I'm all, along for the ride here. And the fact that we are wondering, you know, what, how, and, and maybe it's because of this, like it shows that we're having to do a lot of work as readers. Yeah. When I, I kind of felt like there's a lot of balls in the air here, a lot of characters and a lot of people I want to know more about. And I and, and even the characters that I was rooting for, oh, oh, Anwar among them, like I just I needed to I needed more in order to connect the dots, I guess, amongst all of these relationships. It's ambitious to talk to write about family in a re- believable way. It's really easy, I, ex- I suspect, um, to write like dialogue that just sort of is clunky and like, uh, you know, ugh. Um, it, it, it's really hard to make that seem I think like believable um, in such a short 
amount of time when in the book but yeah i needed more i think with both of those instances they were just shocking i think it's like the trade-off between um and generally but when you're writing about family or more than like four people it's do you have character development or do you have equal time for each of those characters and you have to pick one unless you want to write a really long book so like one of my favorite books about family is The Lives of Others by Neil Mukherjee, but that book is like eight, 600 pages. It's huge, but that gives you time to like really get to know the characters. And I I found that um, when I read shorter books about family, it doesn't get me in the same way. Like to your point, point Lauren, like I didn't have a resolving feeling about Anwar or like Ella or anybody really in the book because they didn't have, I didn't get enough from them. Yeah, I also got this sense that the author was trying to provide each character some sense of like wish fulfillment in a way. So it's like every character, whether or not it lasts, has a relationship with someone or comes back to it. And while that is, satisfactory for the characters in some way. Um, maybe that's one of the things that makes it feel like there's too many balls in the air because, you know, you're doing this, this kind of arc for each character and they're going to, they were going to want this thing. They're going to get this thing. It might not be the thing that they s- stick with or, but um, maybe that just made added too much, you know? Um, yeah. Just like, like you're saying, Lauren, just too many, balls in the air and so nothing is nothing feels finished i i wonder with it with the death of anwar and hashi which i was so shocked by and saddened by because they just had this beautiful day together but if l would have never gotten that letter if had that not been the case because anwar spent so much of the book going like trying to tell that story or even trying to remember that story and trying to knowing he wanted to share it but he couldn't so maybe that was the 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 vehicle for getting that letter into their hands. I loved that scene. It was so startling and so abrupt and, and almost took your breath away. Um, it was so unexpected, but I thought it was, I don't the tra- know. I really, the traffic I really, accident. Yeah, yeah, that's their death. Um, I am so effective because I had kind of fallen in love with those two characters all over again. And they had, as Lucy said, they had just had this beautiful day, partly full of nostalgia and partly just uh, dreaming and joking. Remember how they're making up stories about places where they are. One says, this is the place where a sailor something, something. And the other one says, oh, this is the play. Do you remember this? And, and then it's like real life. It's never done. It's never finished on time or on your schedule. It just happens. So I, I really love that scene a lot. Well, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. No, 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 please. Go ahead. Yeah, I've been go talking. Ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say the scene near the end of the book where um, where Charo sleeps with, um, is it Malik? Malik? I don't know. How Malik? Right, sorry. Um, her line, I loved. She says, you know, something about... Um, this is not this is not the the best sex I'll ever have. This is not the last sex I'll ever have, but this is the only time I will have sex with a man who knew my parents. And I just love oh, yeah. kind of the naked honesty of that and her total realistic admission of um I'm with this person and we're together now, and we won't be together forever. I thought it was so kind of brutally honest. I, I really like that line as well. So I need I've interrupted you twice now. <laughs> I, 
I, I needed to hear her say that because I was like, Malik is not, I'm not, that's not my favorite person in this book. He's kind of just like, you know, a very charming, attractive young man, the kind that, you know, very attractive young girls can get wrapped up in. He's cool. He plays the bass. It's like, no, you got to run for the hills. He was a prototypical Daisy fuckboy. Like, we knew what he was. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, this is like something for your late teens, early 20s. Hopefully this is your (laughs) mid-20s. Yes. And I was like, good for her for saying that because I needed to hear her say it because he's not the moment yeah but that was a beautiful line christopher thanks for reminding me of that i really it hit me too this is a like i wanted more of that kind of intimacy i wanted more of that like throughout the book and there were those jewels truly of lines that i felt like dang like yes that's it like and i honestly i wanted that for ella i was i was rooting for ella i wanted like ella was such a like an interesting is such an interesting character uh to me and and um and and then l and turning into l and going by l and like um i i yeah i just wanted i mean i mean i wanted more of that awakening um for l and and yeah it's kind of like what lucy was saying i i did feel like okay she or l got something at the end that was um it got it, it, there was a transformation of sorts, but it just, yeah, the pace, I wanted more lead up or maybe more f- reflection or something um, because they're a great character. Elle is a great character. And that introspection um, at the end, I was really, I mean, maybe it's because of the death of her parents that she was forced to grow up in like, in a way that, I mean, obviously the very rushed way and very traumatic way, but coming to terms with self and not um, allowing yourself to sugarcoat your feelings anymore because you don't ever know what's going to happen. Um, maybe that was the impetus. But again, it's these maybes, not a known of character development. Um, I was actually, I mean, Lauren, you really brought it up, but I was wondering what y'all thought about Ella then L as a character. Um. It, 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 it reminds me of that scene where, or the, the number of scenes where Hashi is able to, as Lucy had brought up, see into somebody and then make that thing manifest on the outside. And that scene where um, Hashi did L up like L's father. And everyone was like, you just look just so much like your father. I was like, I, I see what, I see, I know what's going on here. And especially after she had, um, she did, what's the, what's the Guyanese guy with the, guy is not the right word. The Guyanese person with, she did their nails. I was like, Whoa. do you know what I'm talking about? Or am I throwing this yeah. out crazy? It's not. Yes. Good. It's the, the guy who has a table. Yes. Oh, Rashad? It, Rashad. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. In a funny way, I, I, and this is definitely the comic book nerd jumping out in me. Everyone in this book kind of had a superpower. <laughs> like, how she was able to like see into people and do that, and like, and Elle could have you know have these visions, and and Anwar w- was an amazing gardener, and it, of uh, uh, it felt natural. Um, Elle coming into their own authenticity, it, it felt like a natural. Um, inevitability at least from from my point of view reading this book i i one of the things i liked about al was their hallucinations i thought um it was really interesting in the beginning um you know i think they make mention of the fact that an mri had been offered but they never did it and it's almost like this this um this idea of well this is really a piece of who i am and it makes my life strange. It makes my life weird. It's disruptive, but who am I without this? You know? And I, and I also think it's just, um, it's a different way of thinking. I mean, it, it seems like it might seem like unacceptable. You would read this. Well, I could never stand to have hallucinations all the time or people don't do that, but I, I don't know. It sort of just makes it change for me. It just changed the way you look at things like this person, sees these things differently. And the people around her were often kind of jealous of, of what was coming 
um, well, the hallucinations, but I just felt that that was a place where Elle could be more like you're saying, Jacob, that, you know, they started to come into their own. And I think that the hallucinations were a place where they could be more unfettered and sort of liberated. And um, I like that that wasn't fixed, that that was still a part of them. Yes. Why does Elle have these hallucinations? It doesn't matter. Like, um, and in the same way, it's like, why am I, you know, why am I queer? Why, why do I feel as though my gender is this way? It doesn't matter, it just is. And like, that's like, that's good enough. And that's a, a message I, I really enjoyed kind of seeing expressed. It also, I mean, and not to say that the hallucinations are a metaphor for anything else, but it does remind me of neurodivergency and the ways that, um, I, I hope we get to a place as societies or little mini societies where neurodivergency isn't seen as something we have to accommodate for or like fix. It's more like at a base level or foundationally we've built it so and like built expectations where neurodivergency has, doesn't have to be excused. We just like figure out how to work with it as a collectively and like not no need to really question it. alongside with like queerness and gender fluidity, et cetera. And like the hallucinations I think are just such a stark example because no one's ever heard of, or like very few people have heard of hallucinations as part of your existence. I also like that there was no uh, explanation ultimately for it. And I love magical realism where you just go with it because this is what the world is. And I wouldn't really call this book magical realism, but I think that maybe this one aspect of it is in there. And I, I appreciated that too. Yeah. You know, it's just part of her. I, and Jacob, I love this idea of all of these characters being like superheroes. Charo yeah. was a superhero with her sewing. Yeah, yeah. You know? It, yeah, it was kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it for sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, you just brought up magical realism, Christopher, and I think one of the strongest parts of this book for me was just the magical place, the location of the house, and kind of like, I don't know, like how characters use the house. I mean, people were like sleeping in hammocks, sleeping on the grass, <laughs> on the garden. I felt like people were every which place. I mean, there's the, yes, there's the door we already discussed or on Mars area to Ramona's, but like, you know, most of this is benign. And I, I enjoyed like the kind of like, I don't know, the closest thing that I could uh, grasp to is the Royal Tenenbaums movie, you know, where like the house, the mansion is like, I don't know, tricked out with just every little room seems to have a personality. I felt that about particularly the garden and uh, parts of the house. And I just, yeah, I felt like how people are scampering out of windows and such. It just felt like a kind of like a, a fortress of weirdness. And I, I liked that. And at the same time, the house isn't a character in the traditional sense of how locations can be characters. It's a beautiful setting to help uh, ena enable a lot of the character developments or interactions. Um, but it's eventually at the end of the book when they have to figure out how to sell it or figure out a way to deal with the financial responsibility of the house. There's nostalgia and there's wanting to like hold on to it, but also recognition that we have to move forward. And I think that that's a really beautiful, I guess, like way of thinking about physical space. So I'm curious because uh, a few of you mentioned this at the beginning. What like the sets, really small section of Bangladesh? What types of questions did you walk away with, or things that you researched, or general? Oh, this is a new history and culture. Like I, I'm just very curious. What did that look like for y'all? Um, well, I was interested. I mean, I just like kind of looked up, you know, Bangladesh and like 1971 when the, and that, I, I mean, that there's a genocide, you know, that I don't think 
that is talked about ever. Like, you know, it's just this weird secret thing. I mean, it's not secret, but you know, it's, it was a genocide and um, that was surprising to learn that. And I'm glad that I, I looked a little further into that. Cause like, for me, you know, I think about characters in this book or especially someone like Elle, just that intergenerational trauma. And then if, you know, Anwar was there and Elle's father was there, you know, fighting in this. And, and even if Elle is not there, like what, what gets passed down? How does trauma get passed down through generations? So um, that was interesting to, to learn about that. Um, and also just to the fact that I had to learn about it from this book that you know, wasn't something that I knew about. I'm just so ignorant of so many parts of the world. I was intrigued by uh, the culture of Bangladesh. I, I don't really know what it looks like. I don't know if it, if most, I think most people are Muslim. I think it's, you know, a very uh, densely populated Muslim country. But I, but it seems like from the book, it's infused with all of these other cultural traditions from other, uh, from other cultures besides Islamic culture. And I was really interested in that as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, partition in 47 is what created such a densely Muslim culture um, on both sides of the border between West Bengal, the state in India, and then Bangladesh, the nation state. Uh, it was very mixed with Hindus and Muslims and Christians because there were missionaries that ended up there and indigenous, like, syncretic uh, practices. Um, so you're right, you're 100% right that historically there's been much more mixing than what you see currently. Okay. It sounded so colorful from the description, like you said, it was yeah. the travel log. Yeah. Another thing that I had to look up and I did find a picture of was the bridge that is created out of the, like the roots of the rubber tree. And that's like really a thing. And I mean, obviously, but I just was so fascinated and they take the roots and they weave them in. And it, it, it was amazing to me. Um, it's like, yeah, this book definitely sent me down some rabbit holes, where it was, but I, I love the description of that. And I, I have a poster there that's like, look this up. You know, I have to see a picture of that. So. For me, um, what stood out was uh, the hour-long plane ride from Dhaka to Cox's Bazaar. And like Cox's Bazaar sounded totally sweet. I, uh, I had to Google that. And I don't know, Sheila, you just mentioned like there's this mixture of cultures and I mean, Cox's Bazaar. What? Like, where is that coming from? What kind of settle, what kind of like, I don't know, like beachhead was that um uh, it's just a strange name right um i was not expecting that name to me um when i was reading about bangladesh so um i mean i i, I enjoyed the setting of that particular uh, moment of the travelogue so to speak of bangladesh um it really felt like palpable in the way that it to, by contrast, I didn't feel that about Dhaka. I, I think Hashi is the character who says something like, yeah, this is just like New York, you know? And I was like, really? Like, come on, like, give me more. Uh, and Anwar just kind of goes, yeah, I think. I mean, this is my, <laughs> it's been a, a, a month, but I, I wanted more of Dhaka, you know, to, to balance the richness of the setting of Cox's Bazaar. I wondered if other people felt that way. Yes, the, the world's largest, is the world's largest beach or something? I was like, I want to go there, whatever that superlative was. Um, what I, in, in, in regards to that particular setting, what did you feel when Elle was swept away into the sinkhole of doom into the ocean? Like trepidation, but also almost like, you give yourself into it. Yeah, the, the, the writing did not scare me the way that the scene of the parents dying did. It was transformative in a way. Yeah. 
and I wonder how that particular setting lent itself to that moment. I think I read that passage so, uh, not quickly, but I, I don't think it really stuck with me that that strongly. This is when she cuts herself on the bo on the the boat. Is that right? And then uh, I think her brother cousin is it her brother cousin rescues her. Yeah. Right. It. Um, it didn't have a lot of impact for me. I think. I think I read it just too quickly. I mean, I kind of am in between the two where I don't, I remember it, but not so intently as like other parts of the book. And again, like intentional or not, maybe the way that I'm reading it or thinking about it now is it's such a, it's, it can feel like so blase, like the transformation and thinking about how you feel about yourself. It comes in little steps or in little ways that um, it may not be super memorable or you may not be able to pinpoint exactly when you come into yourself. Wow. Is this when she begins bandage around her chest? Okay. Now that we're talking about it though, it, now it's just seeming more baptismal almost, you know, like mm -hmm. you go into <laughs> the water and then you come out and you're, you know, <laughs> there's this, in a sense, a rebirth. So it, it's interesting because I didn't, um, I appreciate that you pointed this out, Jacob, because I, I didn't think about it that much, but now I am thinking about it differently. Yeah, I, I thought about it as all those little things that add up, and this was the thing that pushed you over the edge. And they realized, like, hey, I'm all bandaged up, and I think I kind of like this. Like, I'm not the person I was before this. Um, but then I was like, am I reading a little bit too like <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I was that. I was eager to hear what you guys had to say I think you were right on the money um and I actually wanted to bridge no pun intended uh two points from Lucy and Christopher um the living root bridges that are described in the book are also in India so I've actually seen them on the India side and they the commonality between the bridges in Bangladesh and the bridges in Meghalaya, which is a state in Northeast India, that's where Kasi people live. So it's Kasi people who built and like uh, nurtured these bridges over millennia. Wow. Wow. They're really cool. They're yeah, really, it, that just cool. seems unbelievable to me. I don't, I, you know, it's just, um, it's just something magical about it, so. Um, and then I, I, I quickly, the reason I asked like what your all's um, reactions to the Bangladesh part were is because, and I know this is something Fatima would say too, so I'm definitely speaking on her behalf. Um, a lot of what her and I experience with South Asian diasporic writing is this romanticization of the trauma that has happened and what like it hypothetically might mean for existence here and what it means like generations down the line. And honestly, without that, that um, like t again, 10% like trip to, to Bangladesh, this book wouldn't have been impactful because you don't get to understand the direct relationship between places and between experiences and what culture looks like in both places in real time. Um, and <laughs> Basma was just at my place this weekend telling me like, we were just talking about like how e exhausting it can be for us to meet other second, first, second, third generation um, people in the diaspora who have such strong political allegiances, even though they've never lived there, uh, or don't really have a full grasp or, of the nuance of what it means to be in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka now. And that like the history your parents come to the States with isn't also the reality of what's happening on the ground. Um, so while like they didn't, delve in, while Tanai didn't delve into the politics or history, it sets up the reader to do a little bit more digging for themselves and like start to understand the long, long lasting impact. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, that's definitely the experience I had. Like I just needed to know more and then it helped 
explain something about the characters to me. You know? Exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like um wow, that that's that's really heavy stuff. And I I like I I don't know if this novel really set out to really do like to, to do much. I mean, I don't know what tonight's is trying to do, but I, I feel as if like I wanted as the reader for Anwar's letter to last like a hundred more pages. You know, I, I mean, I guess I was coming at this from like, you know, I just did my Rishi ready, like, you know, passage West, like historical fiction, deep dive. Like I felt like just like my brain was like, I don't know, like it, it felt like lit up with all kinds of new, you know, pieces of information about American history and how, I, I don't know. I, I just felt like with this, I wanted it felt so momentous because Anwar was struggling with this memory. He was struggling to recall it. Then he was struggling to figure out when to tell it, how, and, um, you know, I just, I, as a, a ignorant, you know, totally ignorant of this whole of, of the history, I wanted like that to just last and last and last. And it was, it was, I uh, found um, satisfaction in it as a reader and I definitely felt like also like okay there's a lot here you know and uh we got to find some other books yeah yeah <laughs> oh that's kind of like uh, that the um hearing you say that Lauren it's interesting uh and I don't know if it was intentional or not but it's an interesting technique as an author to think like I'm going to give you some of this but then you're going to have to do some work too and you're going to have to, you know, if you want, go out and learn more. And, and I don't know if that was what their motivation was, but it, you know, um, it certainly like for me, it did make me want to learn more. And so the book wasn't going to give me all the answers and whether or not that felt satisfactory now that I'm thinking about it, it's like, well, that's actually a pretty cool thing for the author to do. Like you got to meet me halfway, you know? So well, this is a different way to look at it, you know? I just double checked and I realized that they didn't put any resources in the back of the book. Even like, if you like, here are some places to stand. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, nothing. Like, just go, go, go. You have You're on your own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got Google, I guess. <laughs> we have more than what they had in 1998. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, so like the last thing I, I do want to ask y'all is about the concept of displaced love. We see that quite a bit in the characters, whether it's for a short period of time or an extended period of time. And just um, would love to hear if you picked up on that theme at all. And if so, what resonated with you? I thought one of the strongest relationships was really between Rezwan and Anwar in a way because uh, Anwar seemed to really love Rezwan so much and look up to him and feel guilty to to him when he cheated on cheated you know because uh, he was married to his sister and married to Rezwan's sister and he thought about Rezwan so much. And that I think that's one of the relationships that really came forward for me so much. Of course, it's not really a romantic love, but it was a real kind of love, I thought, in the book. And, and you know, in a way, it's a kind of pure love because when someone is dead, you you can easily idealize them, even though there were a few moments that Anwar talks about where Rezwan was a little critical, or you know, I think at one point he I don't I don't recall the exact lines, but you know, there there was some friction there, but now I think Anwar really idealizes Rezwan and loves him so much. Almost like, yes, he raised Ella as his own, but there was this 
unease almost between them, maybe because of the love he had for her father. And the for me, like that displacement kind of looks like that space between them. Another interesting, oh, so no, go ahead, Jacob. I was just going to say, I think that um, Charu and, and Stalin, what, as a nickname, um, that was kind of an interesting case of, like, misdirected love, maybe not miss, you know, that she was like, all right, I know he's my uncle, but he's just, there's some, you know, so, like, that's off-putting, but they there certainly was something there, um, and that just, that was an interesting relationship. I could not make heads or tails of that. Um, but then I kind of thought about it in Charu is, is, is putting her eggs in all sorts of baskets, you know, trying to figure out, you know, where am I going to put my love? Like, what am I going to do with this? And I was like, you know, that is some, like she, she put her eggs in that really weird basket of her uncle. Still don't know what to make of it, but I, I, <laughs> I something I really enjoyed reading about was, was that was that whole concept of like you know sometimes you misplace your love and I in in a very split second in a very quick moment that is what Anwar did with Miss Ramona. So it's like yeah, it, it's all messy and like everyone's goofing really hard and that's that's life that's love that's but that's what it is like yeah i, I kind of want to talk about this stalin char situation because like they're related by blood but they've never met and they don't yeah. know each other and it's very weird makes me very uncomfortable but at the same time if you're building rapport with somebody as adults and like there is a chemistry it's because they've never known each other. That chemistry could have easily been fostered as friendship and just reimagined as something more when it was gross and wasn't. Yeah. Well, yeah, they can't almost like they, that this is their first meeting. And so as you're saying, they're both adults. It's almost like you don't have real control over if there's some chemistry there, then. Yeah. <laughs> And it's definitely like, well, so then where do you place it? You know, it's, it's placed it's, it somewhere. Oh yeah. Yeah. But it's just definitely, it's interesting to think about. It certainly made me uncomfortable. Um, I, I kind of just felt like I took that whole inner, like, again, like the travelogue fits because it's like, you know, you're, you're, when you travel, you're in a different state of mind about everything. You're open. Okay. We're doing this. Okay. I'm gonna, uh, let's go here. Let's, you know, I don't know. I, I felt like it was almost like Charo just sampling like the smorgasbord of like, just what life had to offer her, um, romantically in, in Bangladesh. And then she kind of knew, I mean, L checks her afterward when she, you know, has a liaison with some random guy on the beach. Um, and she, and, and Charo just says like, I, I don't know what that was. Like, don't judge me or something along those lines. I believe I just remember feeling like, yeah, that seems, that seems real. I don't know. Like Jacob to Jacob's point, love is messy. I don't know. Um, I, it's really hard to do much with that besides just, Kind of enjoy the fact that like okay Chara's like figuring herself out mm, yeah yeah also lauren i think that was right after her parents died yes and, you know that's a, a kind of a kind of misplaced love in a sense of wanting to feel something or missing someone or just being confused maybe yeah, I could. In, I interpreted that as very cathartic, uh, doing something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. If my memory serves me, she says, "I just wanted to feel something," yeah. and I was like, "Can't be mad at your sister." Right. Also, better this rando than her uncle. Yeah, I, that is exactly. Yes, I, I felt that there. too. <laughs> Well, we are getting close to the hour mark, um, but this has been a really great discussion. Um, this, like I've been given some different insights into the book than I had when I came here. So thank you everyone so much for participating. And thank you, Sheila, for facilitating this 
for us. Um, as always, I really appreciate it. So thank you, everybody. And oh, here's again, oh, my book, my background book. But this here. is what books should look like. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah. Uh, you needed uh, the visual cue for people who are listening. Um, as always, reading with a group of people is so much more rewarding than reading on your own. So mm -hmm. If you want to join your own book club or if you want to join ours on erasebookclub.com. Uh, yeah, happy reading, everybody. And thank you to the Ann Arbor District Library for engaging with the book. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila.